Professor Petropoulos joined CMC in 1999, so this is his 21st year uh, at CMC. Uh, he has taught in the history department the entire time. Uh, he also co-founded the uh, Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights at CMC with Professor John Roth. Um, it's now called the McGrooglian Center for Human Rights. Um, you also see Professor Petropoulos frequently uh, in Europe uh, attending many of our Euromeet programs. So thank you for your service, not only to our incredible students, Professor Petropoulos, but also to our alumni and parent community year over year. You're a speaker at Alumni Weekend, a speaker at Family Weekend. We certainly appreciate your dedication uh, to the college. On a personal note, I have taken two courses with Professor Petropoulos back in my student days and attended two academic travel trips in addition to Europe travel uh, with Professor Petropoulos. And it's a thrill to have you here today Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we're very excited to hear about your, your book that's uh, coming out in January. Um, and, and again, thank you and welcome. So Professor, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Evan, for that kind introduction. Let me share my screen now. And one second, current slide. There it is. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be here. And I was looking at the Zoom, uh, frame there and I can see that we're over 158 participants. I'm so honored and it's great to see so many former students. Uh, I can see Elena Seifert and Tyler McBrien and many of my other favorites there. So um, what an honor, what a privilege. Uh, and, I, and even my former st student Evan there, although I confess I feel very old when I realize you're the head of alumni affairs now. And uh, yeah, we go back a few years now. So this is very exciting for me. I get to talk about my new book. Um, it's finally done. Here's the cover. Um, um, I, I like it. I th the press, Yale University Press chose it, but it turned out to have some significance to me. The picture that you see the orange or reddish uh, square there, that's a picture I have worked on helping restitute for the past 18 years. It's from the Kassir family in Berlin. It has nothing to do with Paris, actually. But um, when I saw the image, I immediately thought, oh my, and the press had no idea when they chose the cover image that it was something I'd worked so hard on. Unfortunately, we lost the last round of the case, the trial in December, and it's being appealed now up to the Supreme Court. So that's a long shot. Um, it's absolutely a stolen picture. It currently, uh, it's a Pissarro picture that's in the Thyssen Bornemisza Museum in Madrid. Um, but it's interesting. It's going to be memorialized now as my dust jacket cover. Um, this book is very much the culmination. I hate to use that word because I feel like I have a few good years left in me. Um, um, but it is uh, represents the entirety of my work uh, in this area of Nazi art looting and allied restitution for the past 38 years. Um, and I structure my remarks a little bit along those lines to give a sense of how this fits into the larger body of work. Um, I couldn't have written this book without the, the previous ones and they all kind of fit together. And my apologies to those of you who have heard parts of this talk before. Um, you know, one of the one of our recent one of our deans said recently that uh, with books, they, they always, the deans, when we report on our annual update, they hear the book coming and they kind of see it rise on the, on the horizon and the book is there. And then we report it for a couple of years after we publish a book. So we're, we're approaching the apogee in this arc right now. Um, but it grows out of my, my work, as I said, going back to my doctoral dissertation in the first book, which is about the Nazi leader's interest in art. And back in the 1980s, when I discovered this topic, that was the critical mass for the field. We were working on top Nazi leaders and what they did to implement these genocidal um, policies. But I, you know, I discovered in the 1980s that there was a gap in the scholarly literature and there had never been an academic study of the Nazi leaders' art collections and what this tells us about them. So I jumped in and, and wrote this book and, and I discovered that nearly every, no, not nearly, every Nazi leader had an art collection that today would be valued in the tens of millions, if not billions of dollars, right? Uh, Adolf Hitler had planned the Fuhrer Museum and it had an, an order of 10,000 old master paintings. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., has about 3,000 pictures, right? So it was a massive undertaking. Himmler too, uh, although Himmler's doing the giving here, but you know, Goering had 2,300 pictures in his various residences. You know, these were extraordinary collections. And, you know, and it wasn't just the very top Nazi leaders, as you worked your way down the hierarchy, 
Robert Lai, the head of the German work front, the massive, massive Nazi union, um, you know, he had a, a collection of several hundred pictures, right? So what I did with, with the study was I reconstructed the collections for the Nazi leaders and then I analyzed them, right? And I won't go through the entire book, but some of the factors were clearly very ideological. That was one analytical category. Um, here you can see the Fuhrer principle, what interested Hitler was gonna interest his subordinates. Um, a second analytical category for explaining this behavior was more sociological. The Nazi leaders use these artworks as props and in, in a kind of a, in a theater set, a stage set. And just as they had, they had servants in livery and they, they tried to, to uh, become a new elite and, and mimic the old feudal elite, well, artworks were crucial props in that whole theater, right, in that effort. And the third element was more anthropological, uh, a culture of gift giving developed amongst the Nazi leaders and art was the preferred gift. And you could tell a lot about their relationships and how their career fortunes were going by the kind of presence that they were receiving. And here Hitler is giving Goering a picture of a woman hunting with a falcon. Uh, Goering was the Reich hunting master. So a lot of times these gifts had little messages embedded and I tried to decipher the messages, right? So the first project was about the Nazi leaders, understandably. And as I was finishing that project, one of the referees for the press said, there's all this interesting material on the art experts who built these collections for the Nazi leaders. Can Petropolis say more about, about the, the experts who collaborated and, and such? And that was the project of Faustian Bargain. And I apologize for this image, but you know, this was what happened in the early 1990s as scholars looked at second rank figures and you know, what they did during the war and especially during the Holocaust. And this image is not only gruesome, but it's a very interesting one because scholars realized that with the figures behind looking at this, at this poor soul, um, it was published this picture during the Third Reich and it was called The Last Jew in Venetia in Ukraine. But what we what we discovered this, there's over 11 different uniforms represented back here. This is an SS person, but there's Hitler Youth, there's German Labor Front, there's the Wehrmacht, and we realized there are a lot more people involved in the genocidal killing than was previously believed, right? And, and so my generation, we started to look at the second rank. We, the archives started to open after the fall of the wall and we could get a sense of what happened to these people. And just to tell you about one individual who I'm still very interested in, I was working yesterday on an expert report for some litigation involving um, this gentleman, and Kaiten Muehlmann on the right, he is the greatest art plunderer of all time. No one has ever stole as much as Kaiten Muehlmann in history, whether it's Napoleon's expert Vivant Denon, no one came close to Muehlmann. Muehlmann was an Austrian and he was charged with stealing in Vienna in 1938, right after the Anschluss. And there he is in the second rank there, walking behind Goering there. And he plundered from the Rothschilds and these you know, other famous Viennese Jewish families. Um, and from there, he went on to Poland and he was still working as an art historian, creating these books about why the good culture found in Poland and Eastern Europe is really Germanic culture. And this was one of his art books from his time there, but really he was stealing, right? He led a plundering commando and they went after everything they could get their hands on from masterpieces, this Raphael from the Czartoryski collection. Um, it's still missing today. It is the most sought after picture lost in World War II. Uh, it was last seen with General Governor Hans Frank in his Bavarian country house, but we don't know where it is today. But Muehlmann stole this and he also stole ordinary quotidian kinds of property, right? That's one thing about Nazi art plundering you have to realize. They, they weren't going just going after masterpieces. They tried to take everything they could. Okay, maybe not the kitchen sink in this instance in this Amsterdam apartment, but everything they could. And we have to understand with Muehlmann and with the other plunders that there is part of the genocidal project, right? They're taking a people's cultural property. And I just wanted to show you, you know, what it looks like to plunder, right? This is loading up, you know, Artworks, yes, but furniture and rugs and Judaica and everything they can they get their hands on, and they would bring it back to Germany. Uh, there was this very important study almost 20 years ago about Hamburg, and Frank Bayor, the scholar there, he determined that 
there was an auction of Jewish property in Hamburg, just one German city, every day during the war. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, they had formal auctions like this, right? This is in Berlin, a, a Jewish auction, the Juden auction, right? And they had these wild auctions, they call it. They just pull up to a street corner. This is near Frankfurt, and they would auction Jewish property. And I think it's a hugely important issue, right? It speaks to, to the point of what did the German people know about the persecution, right? They certainly saw a tremendous amount of property coming in with signs on it, right? There were fur coats that had people's names and sometimes distinctively Jewish names. It was clear to the German people that Jewish property was coming in. And I argue that it was not just the profiting, the material enrichment that the German people enjoyed, if that's the right verb there, um, they experienced better, more neutral. But I think the, the plundering was really important in terms of preparing the way for the killing, the genocide, as a way of distancing the perpetrators from the victims, right? Because if you take a people's cultural property, you put them into a state of abject proper, uh, poverty, then they suddenly look inferior, right? And they started to conform to Nazi racial ideas and racial hierarchies. And when people are starving to death and, you know, on their last legs, of course they look inferior, right? So I argue that both the profit, the incentive was there for the plunderers and the people who benefited, and also the distancing was crucial and that you cannot separate plundering from the Holocaust. So this was really what Faustian bargain was about, you know, it was Muehlmann as a perpetrator. And I tried to, I traced him every way I could, every photograph, every document. I mean, here's Muehlmann sitting at a luncheon with Joseph Goebbels, but at the end of the day, this was kind of the picture I had. I mean, this is Muehlmann's SS file from the Federal Archives in Berlin. And you can see it's been burned, there's water damage. To me, it's always been a metaphor of what I do with these individuals, these subjects. I try to create a, a portrait and get a picture of them, but there's pieces of the puzzle that are missing, right? And, and there were big pieces of Muehlmann missing when I did it. And I've continued the research. You know, At the time when I was doing, when I was really young, my hair was black, I was going to cemeteries a lot of the time, trying to track them in that way. Um, um, but I also was always pushing the envelope for, for archival materials, what we could find. Um, museums, for example, are notoriously uncooperative with certain kinds of files. For the files in museums that are in their archives, those are more or less accessible, though there's exceptions. I'll tell you about one a little later. Um, but for the curatorial files, the things that are in the curatorial departments, which have tremendous information, those have never been available to researchers. And so I was you know, writing about this back in the 90s. Um, we did get some new archives opened up. In 2016, the French opened up this archive for the uh, military justice records, right? For the military tribunals. It's in an army base near Limoges in the middle of nowhere. But to think all these trial records were closed until 2016. And today it's still such a podunk archive. I mean, look at this, you know, I was the only one working in this archive, right? But there's still new materials that we're finding. And I'm still on the case of Muehlmann, um, even though my book is about someone else. But just to tell you a little bit about Muehlmann, he had been captured by the Americans and he was interrogated along with the guy I'm writing about in this book, Bruno Loza. And then he uh, was at the central collecting point, the restitution headquarters in Munich. And he escaped, um, he, well, he feigned illness. He told the Americans he had a stomach problem. They put him in the hospital and he went out the window that very night and he was never heard from again. And so that's when I was searching the, the graveyards. What happened to Muehlmann? And I eventually found it. It was in Salzburg um, and the grave led to his his widow and I found her house, this beautiful villa in the Austrian Alps. She wouldn't let me take her photograph, but she is right in this doorway, believe it or not. Um, but she did let me copy shoot the images of her now deceased husband uh, that were in the attic. So I climbed up into her attic and I took down the boxes of old photos and I, and I, you know, I found that, you know, she told me that Muehlmann had died in 1958, which confirmed what I found in the cemetery. And I could see these images when he came back in the 1950s. Um, I got another clue um, as well from this fellow, Wilhelm Huttel, who, as you can see from the caption, was a general in the SS. And Huttel was a, a horrible perpetrator. He was in Budapest side by side with Adolf Eichmann in 1943 and 44 as they were deporting the Hungarian Jews. Um, I interviewed Huttel a couple times up at his chalet in the Austrian Alps. And I was always so nervous when I was taking his photograph. He let me photograph him, but you can see I'm not a very good photographer. My hand was shaking there of Dr. Huttel. But Huttel was very helpful. He told me a lot about the other 
other plunderers, including Muehlmann. And he said, oh, Muehlmann would come back in the 1950s and offer me paintings to buy. And I'd say, why was he offering you paintings? And he said, well, he knew I liked art. I had studied art history at, as a university student. And I said, what kind of painting? He said, oh, he had old masters and modern pictures. He had great art. And I surmise that these were works that Muehlmann had hidden away during the war, had not been found by the monuments officers or by the allies. They found seven different repositories for Muehlmann, but they didn't get them all, obviously. And so Huttel told me the story, which I thought was so informative. Huttel told me something else. I said, well, what happened to Muehlmann? He said, well, for a while he lived with his mistress. And I said, who was that? Have I ever heard of her? He said, you probably have. It was Lenny Riefenstahl, the filmmaker. And, and so I made an appointment to go see Lenny Riefenstahl. And this is her house on Lake Starnberg outside of Munich, just after she's thrown me out. Um, I talked to her for about 10 minutes, small talk. And then I asked her about Kayatun Muehlmann. Had she ever heard about Kayatun Muehlmann? And at that point she said, I'm sorry, I don't feel well. Ich fühle mich nicht voll in German. You got to go. And so uh, next thing I know, I was out. But I kind of took that as a yes that she had heard of Muehlmann because she threw me out. She did send me this uh, strange uh, photograph from her days as an actor in the 1920s. Um, but I never knew for sure. But more recently, I found this photograph. This is the opening of Riefenstahl's film about the Olympics in 1930, the 36 Olympics is 1938. Uh, and there's Muehlmann. And this is in Vienna. And there's Riefenstahl. So I have a picture of them together. Do they know each other? Well, I kind of think so. But um, so this is the kind of thing I have ended up doing. Um, but with Muehlmann and the others, you know, to tell you the truth, I couldn't obtain that detailed uh, a portrait of them. In Faustian Bargain, there's no treatment of any of the plunders that goes more than 30 pages. And I stretched everything as far to get a complete portrait. This is different. I mean, this is the first time we've had a really developed portrait of a Nazi art plunder. And I think this is the first time we have a really good sense what happened after the war, right? Um, that the paper trail largely has gone dry for, you know, gone dead for, for most of the perpetrators after 1945, 1950. But for, for Bruno Loza, I could carry the story forward till his death in 2007. And Loza was a Berlin art dealer, came from a, a educated milieu. His father was a member of the Berlin Philharmonic and was a great lover of Wagner. Uh, his, his siblings are named Brunhilde and Siegfried, if that tells you anything about, about Loza. He joined the SS in 1932, before the seizure of power. And he claimed when I talked to him, yes, I did talk to him, that he joined for the sports because he played handball and other sports there. He was a very good athlete. I don't think one joins the SS to be to, for the sports. I think this is not a truthful statement. Uh, but he was an outstanding athlete, athlete and won a number of important competitions. He was six foot four. Um, when I saw him, he was absolutely massive and rather terrifying with these great big hands that the biggest hands I've ever seen on anyone. Um, he was he was something. So Loza, you can see from, from his dates back here, right? He's 1911. He's he's quite young, right? So he's you know 32 years old when the Nazis come to power, and uh, excuse me, yeah, 22 years old when the Nazis come to power, um, and uh, he's about 30 when the war breaks out, and he is fighting on the Eastern Front. Uh, he fights in the Polish campaign in September 39, and he's getting ready to invade the Soviet Union uh, in early 1941 when he has an offer. You know, uh, Goering knows that he is an art dealer and Goering needs art dealers. They're plundering so much in Paris. They need people who can catalog, people who can, who can grab the stuff. So there's an offer to be transferred from the Eastern Front to Poland to, to work, in, work with art, art, artworks. And Lo it's a temporary assignment and Loza goes and he doesn't like the work initially, but towards the end of his, his uh, probationary period, after about a month there, he meets Hermann Goering. Uh, Goering comes to the Nazi art plundering headquarters in the Jeux de Pomme Museum, right, part of the Louvre complex, and the two hit it off, and Loza changes his mind and says, I'm gonna stay and work for the Reichsmarschall, right? And you can see from this picture, they had a rapport. Uh, Loza was very self-confident. He would prepare for the meetings. He'd know all the artworks that were gonna be discussed, and he would adopt this very self-assured manner. And Goering liked that because Goering had enough yes men around him and they developed this rapport. And, and Goering would come to the headquarters, the ERR is the Nazi agency, and he, there were 
20 such visits to the Jeu de Palme, and each time he would select between 20 and 50 pictures, right? All told, there were about 700 pictures that Goering selected, never paid a penny for any of them, right? They were all taken, and there was some claim he would pay later, but you know, the check was in the mail. Um, and so Loza was helping prepare these exhibitions and Goering would select them for uh, one of his homes. He had four major residences. Uh, the, the heart of the art collection was in Karen Hall, his home, his estate outside of Berlin. And you can see it's a veritable museum, you know, on a monumental scale. And as I said, there were 2,300 pictures there, um, and, you know, a, a true museum in its own right. Um, so I met La Loza in 1998, um, the same time I was meeting Riefenstahl and Hotel, and I knew that I had this opportunity that the that the Nazis themselves would be dying out um, pretty soon, and I made an effort to go and talk to them um, in 1998. And as a result of what would turn out to be nine years of conversations, I interviewed Loza about 40 to 50 times. I never counted, but I, I have a lot of protocols. Every meeting, I would take careful notes and, and time stamp them, send them to myself. So I, I really interviewed him a lot. And when he died, he left me his photographs. So this is one of the resources I have for my up close and personal portrait of Loza, right? We see Loza here. And this is what it was like to be an art plunder in Paris during the war. Others had rationing others had privation, but not Loza and his ERR comrades, right? They had bottles of wine, they had, you know, huge fish on silver platters. Um, it was a very good war for Loza. Uh, we can see his in his photos, he had, he was going out to restaurants, there are a lot of girlfriends there. Um, you know, he, you know, this was part of his war. Um, a strange image as he seems to be putting the car's antenna in this woman's nose. I don't know which woman this is. An even stranger one to follow uh, in a, obviously on a bed with a comrade. Um, this fits a kind of trope of photography during the occupation. Um, scholars have written about it, but it's still a very disturbing image. Loza told me he never wore his SS uniform when he was in Paris, right? That, um, and it turned out that's a lie too. We see, we see him with a sweater, this pullover here, and I subsequently found other images of him. He would go on the raids, on the ERR raids, and he would wear his SS uniform as they went into the apartments that were still warm, right? So, you know, dealing with Loza, you have to deal with the lies, but the photographs gives you something to, with, with, to triangulate, right? Um, I had wanted this to be the cover of my book, to tell you the truth. These two beautiful Matisses, as you see from the caption, the one on the right is in the Norton Simon down the road in Pasadena, and the one on the left uh, in the Art Institute. They came from the Rosenberg uh, art dealing family, but they were restituted at war's end and then sold. So these are not subject to restitution. They're, they're not looted and they were looted, but they were restituted, right? Um, but you get a sense of, of again, the, the rapport between Loza and Goering. But something else you see in this, they're laughing at the Matisse, right? Goering had fairly progressive taste in art for a Nazi leader. He liked works by Van Gogh and, and some others, but Matisse was too, too expressionistic, too wild, too, you know, too modern for him. So he didn't collect this, but this is where an opportunity for Loza came, right? The Germans kept the modern works in their room of moderns. They kept them sequestered from the old masters. And Loza basically could run an art dealing business out of the Jeu de Pomme. And he was taking these modern works and he was trading them with dealers in Switzerland and in Germany and Paris. And he was, I think, absconding with them himself. Um, there was a report that the Germans burned modern artworks in the Louvre gardens during the war. I don't think they did. I'm, I've researched it extensively. They burned frames and some cartons and crates, but they just made the French uh, workers who were there believe they were burning pictures. It was the cover, a disguise for the graft, right? In fact, they were they were selling these and enriching themselves. That that motive of profit coming through, right? But you can you know when you see on the ground what it's like to loot, you can see there's opportunities here, right? It's a rough and tumble business and there's shrinkage as they say in the retail world. And so Lova, Loza was corrupt among other, other things, right? You know, so you just get again the scale as the Nazis were stealing tens of thousands. They say one third of the private art in France was looted by Loza and his cohort in, in, in the ERR. 
Now, Loza had some challenges. Uh, he had a nemesis within the ERR, and that was this woman, Rose Valland, who was a French curator uh, and, and quiet, studious. Uh, she pretended that she did not speak German. She did. Uh, Loza spoke perfect Fr French. He had been in Paris uh, as a student, and, uh, and he had worked in a Renault factory. He had taught sport in a Renault factory, so he could actually speak kind of the dialects there, too. So she concealed that she was spying on Loza and the Germans there. And whenever she went home, every night she would uh, write down what she had memorized, the works that had passed through, you know, what Loza had taken. And after the war, she became his, his nemesis, his prosecutor. Rose Vallon became a monuments officer. Um, they were not just monuments men, they were monuments women. And she is a truly famous person in France. Uh, there's even graphic portrayals. I wouldn't call it a graphic novel because this book is actually based on history and they've reproduced actual photographs in this graphic portrayal. Um, but it's kind of funny to see the Loza character and, and, and Goering in a comic book, if you will, right? This is the, the whole story there. He's, um, she's on stamps and you know she, is a, she was a hero of the French resistance. And so she's part of the story, um, especially because she continues the her rest of her life trying to, to pin these thefts and other misdeeds on Loza. Um, another a chapter of the book, not just a whole chapter, it's a few pages, but something I find extraordinary concerns Max Beckman, um, the great German painter, my favorite artist, I confess. And Max Beckman had left Nazi Germany in July 1937, on the day when the Degenerate Art Exhibition had opened up, and he feared that his work would be uh, attacked and proscribed, which it was. He went to the Netherlands and then was overrun when the Germans came in in May 1940. But he continued to work in the Netherlands. And one of the pictures he did in 1943 is called Dream of Monte Carlo. And we've now been able, I've, I've done this with the help of some art historians, to determine that this is a Bruno, this is Bruno Loza, and this is another art plunderer named Erhard Guppel. And Guppel was one of Hitler's agents, right? Whereas Loza was Goering's agent, and they were rivals, right? And uh, and Guppel happened to be Max Beckman's best friend and biographer, right? So you know these strange uh, relationships during the war, and and Guppel was bringing Beckman paints. He was shuttling letters back and forth. He was keeping Beckman going, keeping, him, and obviously told his friend Beckman about Loza and what had happened in Monte Carlo. And you have to read the book to get the whole story. But um, we've been able to figure out that this individual is Pierre Bonny, who was from the French mafia that collaborated with the Gestapo. He was part of the, 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 the Gestapo used the French underworld uh, and Loza used the French underworld. And so that is Bonny. So there's this very rich picture where you have these knights of death holding their bombs with their hands on Loza and Guppel's shoulders. And if you look, I think the next picture here, you can even see there's blood on Loza's hand. There's more red in the picture. The actual paintings in Stuttgart in the Staatsgallery in Stuttgart. So Loza has this interesting history. I think it's interesting. Um, at war's end, he ended up at Neuschwanstein, the Disneyland castle. Uh, this was one of the repositories for the ERR. They shipped things out of Paris and there were about 22,000 artworks in the ERR. And Loza had also brought the card catalog, the records from the ERR uh, in Paris. And these were crucial because the card catalog told one from whom these works were taken, right? They were the key to restitution. You destroy the card catalog and it's gonna be so difficult, almost impossible to return all these artworks. And so there were real threats on both the art stored here and the card catalog. There were SS divisions in the area that were very destructive and they were torching castles and destroying things. They didn't wanna have any of this cultural property fall into the hands of the allies. And Loza had to talk down an SS general who wanted to come in and, and do some damage. And so he deserves some credit for that, I suppose. Um, and, you know, the, the contents of, of Neuschwanstein were preserved right? in this way, it worked out. And Loza himself, he was arrested right here on this wall of this old monastery, right, that turned, was turned into a nursing home. And he was waiting for the Americans to arrive on May the 4th, 1945, sitting on the wall with a book in French about Joan of Arc, right, he was trying to show himself as an intellectual, as an educated gentleman, and, and who rolls up? Um, is this gentleman, um, 
James Rorimer. He's a monuments officer and he's a famous monuments officer. He became the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? And, and uh, was you know, actually quite a celebrity uh, in this period on the cover of Time Magazine, buying famous works. And, and so Rorimer arrests Loza and there'll be an interesting relationship with some of the Met curators and Loza in the 1950s. Um, Loza was handed over to the OSS, you know, the Office of Strategic Services, precursor to the CIA, and they had assembled the chief plunders at this villa in Austria, in Althausse, Austria. This was also where one of the major salt mine repositories was housed. And for the summer of 1945, they kept about 15 of these figures, including Kajetan Muehlmann, right? You guys know Kajetan Muehlmann now, and Loza there, and they played games on the Nazi uh, defendants that he'd been interrogated. They, they told, you know, Loza that, you know, so-and-so was dead and then they'd arrange for so-and-so to, to show up and cross in a stairway. And then they would, they were playing mind games as they tried to figure out what they had done. Um, one of the key people, the OSS officers was Ted Russo, Theodore Russo, who is a very sophisticated um, curator. He had um, grown up with resources and had uh, had gone to Harvard, an undergraduate, went to the Sorbonne, actually had gone to Eton for high school, Harvard for undergraduate, and the Sorbonne for graduate school, and good with languages, French and German. And so he was one of the, the three main interrogators of these OSS officers. Um, ultimately, the Americans handed Loza over to the French who put him on trial before a military tribunal, hence my interest in those archives. And in 1950, there was a three-day trial of the ER staffers, and Loza is there slightly overexposed in this image. Um, and the three of them were, were found guilty. Loza was acquitted, amazingly enough. And he kept his certificate of his acquittal in his papers, um, the 4th of August, 1950, right? Why did the French acquit him? Well, you know, he had allies giving testifying on his behalf that seemingly helped. The French were tired of all this, you know, these legal proceedings. I think that was a key reason. Um, he had good lawyers. You know, he was he was very clever. It's still ultimately inexplicable why he was acquitted, but he was, and that was the basis for him rebuilding his career. He wasn't completely done with legal processes. He had to go to Switzerland and testify in a trial there, but he really, you know, he was let free, right? 1950, he is a free man, more or less. He is still on watch lists. Um, he's not allowed to travel to the United States. He's a wanted war criminal, but um, on our list, but for Europe, purposes Europe, of Europe at this point, he's a, you know, he's a free man. He, this is his business card, art historian. He moved uh, residences in 1959 to this new apartment in Munich. It was in a beautiful neighborhood in Bogenhausen, um, but it was a fairly modest apartment for what was in it, right? And that was part of his strategy for living below the radar. He didn't have a grand villa on Lake Starnberg. He was, you know, he was in his apartment. Um, he became, you know, visible on the art market. You know, this is for the Bavarian state painting collections, you know, the, the big museum in Munich. And there's a Murillo being offered by Dr. Loza for 1.5 million Deutschmarks at the time, right? So he starts to appear. And here's another art dealer in Munich too. And this is just the card he kept there. But you can see that, you know, here's a series of one, two, but six or seven purchases there. So we get a sense of his activities. And, and it's not just Loza who's active there. It's the other Nazi art dealers who had, you know, been in, in the wartime networks, they revived their careers. So Walter Andreas Hofer, who had the title of being the director of Goering's collection, right? Loza was just the agent in Paris. So this was um, this was the job that Loza really wanted. He wanted to have Hofer's job as director of the Goering collection. Well, Hofer was back in business. This is an advertisement from an art magazine in Munich in 1966, right? An unremarkable picture there, but there's, you know, there's, there's Hofer back. Karl Haberstock, who was the biggest dealer in Berlin in the 1930s and made a fortune selling to Nazi leaders. He had a great fancy gallery. He had moved to Munich and this was his home in Munich. Um, this was the outside of his home. It was actually interesting that Walter Andreas Hofer lived here and the Haberstocks lived here, right? And that's why Loza and in the, in the, he'd make this joke, joke, it was a brown house, which was the Nazi, name of the Nazi party headquarters in Munich, you know, in the Third Reich. So this was a brown house because uh, there was Nazi art dealers living there. Haberstock had 
you know, so he had lost some works in, at war's end that had been looted, but many had been declaimed, proclaimed legal. Um, in fact, they were they were acquired with the profits he made by selling to Hitler and Goering and Goebbels and the Nazi leaders. And he had donated his collection to his hometown of Augsburg and they honored him with a street, right? And it's still there today. There's a Karl Haberstock street, even though he was a Nazi dealer uh, involved with a lot of persecution there. So the Nazi network in, in the 1950s took hold in Munich. It was, uh, it was based in Munich. And this is where, if you've heard of the Gurlitz, right? They had a big cache of about 1,500 works found with the son, the next generation of one of the members of this network. The son had, you know, and these were found a few years ago. So the Munich was the center, but I talk about the golden quadrangle, right? Ge geography made a real difference. Switzerland was contiguous to Bavaria, to Munich. Liechtenstein is contiguous there too, and Austria, right? And Austria, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein are crucial parts of this network, right? That that radiates outward, uh, and this is really what this book is about. So, as I said, my story, but it goes to America too. That's what's one of the things I found really surprising: how Loza was active in the United States. Again, he's on a watch list, right? This is this is Loza. Um, these are the different Lozas. Here it is, Doctor Chief Assistant of Rosenberg's looting office, right? He's on a watch list. He shouldn't come to America, but he does. And who's he go see? His the old OSS officer, Ted Rousseau, who's now a curator at the Met. And their correspondence has been preserved in the Metropolitan Archives, uh, Museum's archives. Some of the documents are closed until 2050. Some are closed till 2070. I don't know what's in them. I'm very interested. Um, but this, that, those which we can see speak to a very close relationship between Rousseau and Loza. Rousseau would go to Europe every summer to go by and he'd always go see Loza. Right? Was Loza just an information broker or was there more? I took the correspondence and I went through it and I listed every artwork that Loza offered to Rousseau and the Met. It's about 40 artworks, fabulous works by Cezanne, Van Gogh, Bruegel, Botticelli, but I can't show any work in the Met having been sold by Loza. However, we have to think that there's a good chance he used a cutout, right, uh, an intermediary, because he still knew that his name was a red flag name, Loza did. But when you see the things that are left there, right, Dr. Loza is just stopping by the museum today with a friend. You just pop in and on Rousseau if he's there. So this relationship is very interesting. It's important to remember that Nazi looted art was still a topic in the 1950s and 60s. Sometimes people say, oh, we didn't know. We just thought all the restitution work was done. No, this is the front page of the New York Times, folks, right? Europe is still hunting. And who would know better about who Loza was and about Nazi looted art than Ted Rousseau, an OSS officer who wrote the first draft of history? So when you see what, where Loza was going in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s, it's amazing. He, Loza told me one story when he was with Rousseau and they were driving through New York in a huge black Bentley and the car belonged to Madame David Vile from the Lazard Frere family, right? Loza had stolen the David Vile's art in Paris during the war and Rousseau had use of the car. He was romantically involved with Mrs. David Vile, that was Rousseau. But can you see, here's Loza 20 years later, he's going through New York in da David Vile's you know, black Bentley, extraordinary. And you can see he had a kind of charisma there, right there and this one. So I um, met Loza, as I mentioned in 1998, and he was always with his associate, Peter Grieber. And Grieber was also an art dealer. Um, when I first met him, I thought he was actually Loza's chauffeur, but it turns out they were, they were much more partners. Sort of strange to see Loza reading my first book there, right? Good ad there. Um, and one of the things I would talk about with Loza in our meetings was this picture of the Fisher Pissarro. And it was stolen by the stolen from the Fisher family. Um, once in Frankfurt, they had moved to Vienna uh, in the mid-1930s, and then with the Anschluss in 38, um, the family had it stolen by the Nazis and they lost it. And there was reason to believe that Loza had something to do with it. It had been exhibited in Switzerland in 1984, and the lender was a Bruno Foundation, this Fondation Bruno. And so, so someone from the Art Loss Register came to me and said, would I ask Loza about this picture? And I did. I said, do you know anything about the Fondation Bruno? And he says, 
No, do you think I'd be so silly to create a foundation in my own name? I wouldn't do that. Um, actually, he did. It was this foundation. And uh, eventually, uh, I was able to get a document um, from Griebert, from Peter Griebert, that show, showed that Loza had sold the picture in 1957 for 10,000 US dollars and taken a commission of $1,500. So that's what I believed at the time, right? That Loza had something to do. He had lied to me all these years, but he had something to do. Uh, Loza told me that this person, Frederick Schoene, uh, had died in the early 1980s, which is true, that he was a lawyer in Zurich, which is true, and that his children had inherited the picture and, ha and had it in a kind of uh, foundation in a state of the heirs. That wasn't true. But we were able to, in a very long story, read the book, um, to track it to a, Swiss bank. Uh, and it turned out it was held in a Swiss bank vault right below the Bahnhofstrasse. They say there's more wealth below the street on the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich there, than there is above the street in any other European city, right? It's just filled with bank vaults and, and that. And Loza had a bank vault. And I got a chance to inspect this with Griebert and we decided it was the right picture. There was some confusion. And Loza died in the process and his bank vault was opened up. They found 14 masterpieces there. Um, plus the pictures that were in his apartment back in Munich. He had a grand total of 40 pictures, but there were serious pictures like Pissarro's, Renoir's, Monet's, Sisley's. He sold a Sisley to the to Zurich, to the art museum there, right? So we finally got a sense of his collection when he had been. But the more I did research, the more complicated it became. It turned out his collection was held in this foundation in Liechtenstein, right? And it was named Schönart. And you say, okay, Right, um, and it turned out it was Schöne and Art combined there. So Frederick Schöne, that lawyer, had created a foundation for Loza. And just to show you how crazy this whole story gets, uh, eventually the picture was sold. Frederick Schöne turned out was the lawyers for these folks. The Wildensteins are the most important art dealers in the second half of the 20th century. The Duvines were the most important for the first half, the Wildensteins for the second. And they get a lot of publicity. One of the spouses of one of the of, of Alec had some plastic surgery gone wrong and they've been the subject of exposés, but they're notoriously secretive, right? And notoriously rich. And they have at least well, they have billions of dollars of art and they're known to hide it away, not just for years, but for generations, right? And then they'll bring it out and sell to individual. And what I found in researching the Wildensteins was that their lawyer in Switzerland was Dr. Frederick Schoene, yeah, right? And I found thousands of works that the, that the Swiss shipped via Schoene into the United States thousands of works, right? This is just one document from 1954, right? The Wildensteins are taking three Gauguins, two Cezannes, a Monet, a Sisley, 15 pictures, and who's bringing them in? Frederick Schoene. So this is the link here, right? Frederick Schoene was not just Loza's representative, he was Loza's partner. Schoene put, his, put Loza's art in his name. Loza would visit Schoene every month and collect his money. He was his banker, his partner, and Schoene is the Wildenstein's man in Paris. And as I assemble these clues, it's clear that a Nazi art plunder is working for this French Jewish art dealing dynasty, right? I don't know if I mentioned the Wildensteins are Jewish, right? So um, it's rather explosive. I'm a little nervous about you know, this revelation. I've written to the Wildensteins and said, I wanna to talk to you. I have a lot of evidence showing, you know, including Loza's own statements. He told me he worked for the, for the Wildenstein. I always thought he was a liar. I could never believe him. But you know, doing my, my due diligence over the past, well, I met Loza in 1998, so this is a 22-year project, I was able to reconstruct his post-war life. He sold these two pictures, these Dewar pictures, to the German Historical Museum for about a million dollars uh, there. Um, he sold, you know, I found that he sold a lot of art in this period, right? So getting a sense of Loza in the post-war period, that's what this book's about. And it, it's really an indictment of the art world you know, in the American museum world. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's not just a book about Loza, but it's about, you know, some a broader environment. Loza, as I said, died in 2007, and that made it possible to do a lot of this uh, additional research in that too. And the slide I would just leave with, a bigger picture slide, um, you know, this nexus of culture and barbarism. And, and so, you know, with Loza, we have, again, someone who was educated, who worked in the realm of art and culture, um, um, you know, who, 
you know, who, who believed in the, uh, the importance of culture. And yet, you know, we see this descent into barbarism. Um, one document I found after Loza's death is from a German aristocratic officer. And it's from right after Loza was acquitted in 1950. And the officer writes to Rose Vallon and says, I don't know how Loza got off. When I saw Loza during the war in Paris, he boasted that he had killed Jews with his own hands. And I came back to Germany and I told my parents after seeing Loza, he and his cohort are being going to be the first ones who hang, right? They're going to be held accountable. Well, Loza really wasn't held accountable, right? And, and, and that, you know, I mean, he had a trial, but, you know, the way he was able to revive his career, um, you know, you can see the limitations of justice. So I'm still grappling with this nexus of barbarism and culture. So thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to take a few questions. Thank you, Jonathan. That was, um, as always, uh, very enlightening. Um, thank you for putting the presentation. Uh, a number of questions have come into the chat. We have about 15 minutes. You can also raise your hand in the participant section if you'd like to ask a question directly. Uh, so a few people have just been very curious on that about how, how you ended up getting an audience with these, with these Nazis and why they were so willing uh, to speak with you. So go through a little bit of, of that. That'd be great. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so I, I, I found out in 1998 that Loza was still alive. I thought he was, um, he had just, he was dead. And, and then someone told me he was alive and I found him in a telephone book. Remember those things? They, uh, I went to a big library in DC and found a telephone book and I wrote him. And I, when I had done my graduate work at Harvard and I had had a chance to get to know two of the three uh, OSS officers who interrogated Loza. Rousseau had died in 1973, so I never met him. But the other two, Lane Faison, who was a professor at Williams College, and James Plout, who was a museum curator in Boston, I knew pretty well. And so, you know, and they had told me a little bit about Loza. And so when I wrote to Loza in 1998, I mentioned that I knew Faison and Plout and, and, you know, from my Harvard experiences. And that was very much a door opener for Loza, right, that he still revered them. Them. He thought that they had treated him uh, respectfully as a fellow professional, and uh, and so you know he you know he was kind of dedicated to them. So that was part of it. Um, you know the Germans, the Europeans have a high regard for academics, and and I think that made a difference that I was a professor and, and they were willing to talk to me. When I got to meet him and I met the other old Nazis, they invariably asked me if I was Jewish, and I'm not. Um, um, and, and so I would tell them that, and I think that had something to do with it. They were, after all, old Nazis, and I think they would have been less likely to talk to a Jewish scholar. I think that was it. Obviously, I speak German, and I could converse with them in their native languages, right? Um, and finally, I think, you know, Loza talked with me because he cared about how he would be portrayed in history. Um, that's something that was a constant when I, even when I uh, got into the archives at the Met, um, one of the files was about uh, the way that James Rorimer, the director of the museum, had portrayed Loza in his 1954 book called Survival. Uh, Rorimer had written his memoirs as a monuments officer, and he had portrayed Loza in a negative light as a plunderer in Paris, and Loza you know, was, was complaining about that. And so I think it was about image management, right? That he, you know, that he cared about how I would portray him. And, and as a result, we played this cat and mouse game the whole time, right? Um, Loza was always much more reliable about what he told about other people. And that's initially what I, I used him for. So he could tell me about Haberstock and Hofer um, about himself. He was less honest, but you know, he, he was playing a game with me to, to portray himself in a positive light. And also, of course, I realize now to conceal the looted artworks he had in his possession, right? Because there were quite a few of them. So he kind of liked this game. And by the late 1990s, he was sufficiently comfortable. He didn't think he'd be indicted. He would be arrested or anything. So I think it was just, you know, it was the thrill of the, of the game with this, you know, this person who he saw as in the tradition of the OSS officers. Um, I have a question in the chat, then we'll go to Ben in the, um, who raised his hand. Um, how does someone become a plunderer in the Third Reich? Do you need to give <laughs> permission? Do you need to give a, a cut back to, back to the state? How exactly did that take place? Mm, that's a great question. Um, there was a need for art plunderers. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the Nazis were stealing art where, wherever they went, you know, the lands they conquered, and they were always short of art historians and art experts. And so if one wanted to be a, a, a plunderer, um, one could let it be known that one had this expertise I and mean, one had to be again, an art historian, art dealer or something of that sort. Um, and you could usually find your way to, to one of these assignments. Now, most people didn't want to become art plunderers to tell you the truth. I mean, even Loza was reluctant initially. I remember he, you know, he was just because he was facing deployment, you know, the battle, attack on the Soviet Union. And, and then he meets Goering and, you know, and feels a connection there. Um, so it's very rare to have people volunteer to become plunders. So it's a great question, actually. And there's networks too, right? So you know, if, if someone's working in the ERR headquarters in Paris and they and they realize they still need more art historians, who do you know? Who can you contact? Um, so yeah, there's kind of these informal networks that 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 occur um, there. And I one other thing I should make clear is at the ERR. Um, headquarters, there was basically two kinds of plunderers who were there. The ER was a Nazi party organization. And the first group were these commandos who were real thugs, right? They wore these dark uniforms. The French always thought they were SS. They're not SS, they're just Nazi party uniforms. And they'd go into these French apartments, these French Jews apartments, and, and they would rip everything out. And uh, they had no appreciation for the art, uh, no, no knowledge of you know, what, what they were looting. And, and, and so that's one cohort of plunderers. Loza, it was his idea, he says, the art historians, the academics who are doing the cataloging, who are running the show, the art, the, the, they need to come on the raids, right? Loza, it was his idea, he says, otherwise we're just creating a mess here, right? And so if you talk about being a plunderer, so the one part is, is really much more violent, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, SS, SA types of people who were just, you know, terrorizing population. And the other part are the are the academics who, who have access to libraries and know what they're plundering. And they both work together. So I guess I would make that distinction that the commandos are a rougher sort. And, and but for the for the art historians, it's about networks and who you know. And if you're interested in coming to Paris and doing this, um, it's a good because you know there were a lot of them who who ended up plundering too, right? You know, there are hundreds of, of Nazi art plunderers who, who are engaged during the war. Great question. Ben, go ahead and unmute and ask me a question. Hello, Professor. It's good to see you. And thank you again for your remarks. Those are fascinating. I, I lost power halfway through your speech. So if you've addressed either of these points, please don't feel like you have to revisit them. But I was interested in whether uh, Losa was himself interested in um, the quote unquote degenerate art of the time and whether he saw it as having value given the way the Nazis thought about um, those artists in the era. And then secondarily kind of how institutions like the Met and other art galleries and museums deal with the kind of moral or ethical half-lives of some of the plundering and the art that exists. I remember from your class um, on museums and leadership, we talked a lot about the responsibility these institutions have to provenance and kind of respecting where the art has come from and to what extent they do or do not acknowledge the plundering or the um, the history of the art itself and how it was achieved or how it was uh, gathered. Oh, great questions, Ben. Thank you. Um, are you still in Vancouver right now too? Are you up in the North Country there? Okay. I'm in uh, in Kamloops in the interior of BC. Okay, good, good. Um, so Loza did like modern art. He liked expressionist art and that was a source of real pride for him because as you know, the Nazis declared uh, abstract art and art that was not represent representational to be degenerate art. And, and so Loza, um, he, it, it, I, his like of modern art, I think, you know, he, he, he was proud of that. It showed that he was not a Philistine, uh, that he's more sophisticated. Um, and I think it was actually truthful. He really did like this art, uh, even though his academic specialty was Dutch old masters, right? And that's one of the reasons that he was in sync with Gurry, and that's really what, what Gurian's favorite art was. But it's oftentimes, uh, there's people like both the old master and the expressionist. Even in German museums in recent years, they've been showing the old master along with expressionists together to talk about the dialogue, like Max Beckman works with old masters in, in, in Munich too. Um, so, but in fact, Loza not only just liked the, liked the expressionist works of modern works, he was um, making money with these works, as I said, during the war. And so these were the easiest ones to steal, uh, you know, if you were gonna, uh, 
be corrupt uh, in the ERR because the Nazis had such a low regard. The Nazis, most, the Nazis didn't want to bring these modern works into Germany. Many of the hardcore Nazis said it would contaminate Germany. So it gave Loza this room to maneuver because he could steal them and secretly bring them in. And um, you know, when I went into his apartment in Munich uh, for the first time in 2000, it took me a couple of years of meeting with him before he finally uh, let me into his home. Uh, he had one whole room, which was German Expressionism with works by Emil Nolde and Gabriela Munter and Mariana Werfken and just a beautiful room of bright colors and then one room of Dutch old masters there. And, and so, um, you know, A, it was a good business for Loza too. Um, he had some, uh, old, some, some modern works that he sold at great profits. He had a Carl Schmidt Rotloff uh, picture. I know he sold in the early 2000s for $2.5 million. So that was a good sale for him. Um, so that was partly it. But again, the fact that he liked this modern art, he could say, look, I'm not boorish, right? I'm sophisticated in, in, in this way. Um, and, you know, there were some Nazis who liked modern art. And that was the subject of uh, my book, Artists Under Hitler, about the continuation of modern in the Third Reich. And so there were other leaders like Baller von Schirach and Goebbels who liked this modern art. So there was that group that was a little bit more sophisticated. Now, in terms of the museums in this history, um, I think it's a really difficult chapter for American museums, right? That, uh, you know, the, the narrative of American museums is that these are the heroic years after the war. 93% of American museums were created after 1945, right? Our museum landscape before the war was so limited. I wouldn't call it a desert. You know, we had the Met in Boston, MFA Boston in Chicago and, you know, what, but, you know, it's axiomatic that art follows money and America was by far and away the wealthiest country in the war, in the world after the war. And that's when our museums were founded and flourished, right? And so um, Tom Hoving, the curator at the Met, um, actually Ted Rousseau was the deputy director under Tom Hoving. He called these years the age of piracy, right? Um, and so, you know, Rousseau was just collecting whatever he could. He was violating French export laws. He was talking to old Nazis. He, you know, he didn't care. He's a swashbuckling curator, right? Um, and, and he likes the danger of meeting old Nazis and all that. Um, so, um, so it was part of the story that has not not been told before. All the narratives of the monuments officers are pretty black and white, right? That, you know, that they were, they were heroes and they safeguarded Europe's cultural patrimony and hardly a critical word is ever uttered about the monuments officers. So this is a kind of intervention, a corrective saying, mm, the history is a little bit more in the gray, gray zone here. Uh, and again, I think it's something that's very sensitive to the museums. I still would ask, why are some of the Loza uh, Rousseau correspondence, uh, those papers closed till 2070. Like, what, what's gonna, what, why can't we see them for another 50 years, right? I still give the Met credit for letting me see them. Um, I mean, I had helped them a little bit. I wrote them a letter of recommendation to get a grant to fund the cataloging of the Rousseau papers and the Rorimer papers um, and that. And so, you know, I'd help them out. So, you know, and I, I checked in with them. I said, are those, is cataloging done? They said, yeah. Um, so they let me see a good portion of the papers. But I think, you know, I have a sense that, you know, they find it these very sensitive, right? And just as the Wildensteins will find this, this history very awkward, um, I think museums uh, will too. Um, one of the letters in the Rousseau uh, Loza correspondence is from the 1950s, from 1959. And Loza says, I know you're gonna find stuff you're gonna like from me. I've been selling to a whole, to US museums like crazy. You know, they, 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 they love my stuff. I've been selling to all these US museums. I just haven't been able to track those, right? I've tracked a lot of Loza's works, but um, it's proving difficult. So there's a lot of indications that US museum curators were reaching out to not just Loza, but there were other old Nazi dealers, right? I mean, Loza is not a one-off. Um, there's other dealers. And, you know, the art world is pretty amoral, especially in the 50s and 60s, you know, and, and, and we see it here. So I think museums today will find this, this, this history difficult. We've passed five o'clock here Ooh. on the West Coast. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much. There, there's a question a few people have asked that I, I hope you can answer fairly quickly. And that's, yeah. when will you book, your book be available and how can I get a copy? Um, 
So my it's it, the publishing date is January twenty second, um, and uh, Yale University Press did actually a very nice job with with it. The photos, the images are, are are great, I think. And so Amazon is there. Um, I do have a little discount sheet. Maybe we can can we send it out through the alumni association too? Um, sure. Um, so I could, maybe we can do that. If um, I think it gives someone twenty five percent off. So if we can do that, um, and if you don't receive it, um, just always you know email me and I'll send you that sheet. So there's, at least you can get it as a discount. But um, yeah, um, I'm hoping I actually sell a few few of these books. I've also been making a documentary film about this too. Um, we finished the filming uh, earlier this fall and um, it's a great, he's a great filmmaker from, from Britain. He does a lot of Simon Shama's films and BBC films. And so um, I think late next spring, we'll have a documentary to go along with, uh, with, with the book, but hopefully a few of you will, will buy a book. Um, so, um, so yeah, so if that, in worst case, just send me an email and I'll, and I'll help you out. Okay. And how does one get a signed copy of your book? Um, just email me. We'll work it out too. And you're just down the street. So we can get the book and then come to alumni weekend or family weekend and we'll, I like that. Exactly. So, that so too. anything for my CMC family. Exactly. Well, thank so. you all. I know there are more questions here. I'm sorry we did not get to get to many of them. Um, as Professor Petropoulos has stated, email him. He, he's, yeah. uh, he's very accessible. He's also at a lot of alumni and parent uh, programs. Hopefully we'll get you back maybe uh, around the time the documentary comes out. And you could yeah, share some more to. insight and answer some more questions. Great. Well, with that, everyone, thank you so much for your time. Have a great uh, evening, ha happy holidays, have a great uh, Thanksgiving break. Feel free to unmute, say hello, say goodbye. Um, have a great night. And again, this is recorded uh, as are all of our programs on the alumni and parents section of the CMC website. So thanks everyone.